Inclusion Talk Series. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rhett Burden. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Compass Family Services, a 501c3 family homelessness nonprofit located in San Francisco. So excited to welcome you all here for the first Inclusion Talk Series of 2024 featuring the amazing Dr. Clay Brook. I have turned on the closed captioning. So again, if the AI doesn't generate exactly what it said, please understand that it's not us. It's just technology doing its thing. All of our Inclusion Talk series are recorded and you can find them on the Compass Family Services YouTube page. Again, please follow Compass Family Services on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so you can stay up to date with everything happening here at the agency. And with that, I'm so excited to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Claybrook. If you can, please put yourself on mute when you're coming into the room. Dr. Claybrook is going to get started. There's going to be some pictures and some videos. We want to make sure that everyone can hear. But Dr. M. Claybrook Jr. is an associate professor of Africana Studies at CSU Long Beach, where he teaches classes on Black history, research methods, and critical thinking. He is also advisor of the Black Student Union and the Black Business Student Association. He serves on the President's Equity and Change Commission and has served as two-term vice president of the Black Faculty and Staff Association. He is also the author of Building the Basics, a handbook for pursuing academic excellence in Africana studies, which offers tips and tidbits and suggestions for studying at home, African deep thought and critical thinking, critical reading and questioning, scholarly writing, and so much more. He is also a lifetime member and regular contributor to Black Perspectives, which is the award-winning blog of the African-American Intellectual History Society and is the leading online platform for public scholarship on global Black thought, history, and culture. He has been published in the International Journal of Africana Studies, the Journal of Black Studies, the Journal of African American Studies, and Africology, the International Journey uh, Journal on Pan-African Studies. He has lent his expertise to Today in LA on NBC4, KJLH's front page with Dominique De Prima, KPCC, NPR, on Air Talk with Larry Mantle and other television, print, and internet media outlets. And without further ado, I turn it over to today's speaker, Dr. Claybrook. Wow. All right. Um, all right. Thank you for, for that um, introduction. It's always interesting when people start reading my bio, I, I forget sometimes. What how much I've done and well like are they really talking about me? Um, so I, I I appreciate that and it's kind of humbling um, when when that happens. So I appreciate that and thank you to um, Rhett for for reaching out and giving me this opportunity and thank you to uh, Compass Family Services as as well. It's uh, greatly appreciated. And if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is take a moment and um, just pay um, some respect to Dr. King's um, son, uh, Dexter King, who passed away uh, yesterday. I have, um, hopefully you, got, you all can see this. Uh, the King Center, which Coretta Scott King started after Dr. King was assassinated, uh, put out this, uh, well, if you click on the homepage here, and then they have the uh, press release about his, about his passing. So I just wanted to just share that as a resource and learn some, if, if you're interested in learning some things about Dexter King. And if you don't mind, if we could just take a moment, uh, have a moment of silence for say a little prayer or send some positive vibes, positive energy, just a recognition and, and some respect for um, Dexter King and his um, and his transition to be with his mother and father.
All right, thank you. So <clears throat> let's just jump right into it. Let's just jump right into it. Um, the title of the presentation is actually a question. Why, are we, why do we celebrate Dr. King? Uh, so before I get into it, let's hear from Mrs. Coretta Scott King and how she responds to that question. Can you all see the screen here? It yes. Who was coming? Congress did outright opposed the birthday as a national holiday, and then others wanted to do something else, a commemorative coin, build some monument. Why was it that you insisted on the birthday becoming a national holiday? I felt that a holiday was an occasion where we could begin to institutionalize his teachings uh, and, and his whole meaning, and hopefully uh, over a period of time, we could uh, the, the whole fabric of our society would become less violent and more peaceful. And it gave that kind of occasion to do that, and then not only to do it on that day, but to work for it throughout the year. So that's why I thought the holiday was much more meaningful. Martin didn't really need it for you know, to recognize him, but but that the nation and the world needed it. Now you, the nation and the world needed his teachings. The nation and the world needed his teachings, and that resonates with me. And I'm going to delve into that a bit more. But who am I? Good question. Glad you asked. So let me just, you heard a bit of my bio, but let me um, just share a, a, a bit more um, about myself. So my name is Dr. Keith Playbrook, as introduced, um, and I've published on a diversity of, of topics. Um, I love doing intellectual histories people like Dorothy Height, uh, James Farmer, um, who were very instrumental in the Black Freedom Movement. I have another one that should be coming out hopefully later this spring on Rosa Parks. What I try to do is focus on aspects of these individuals that we generally uh, don't hear about or know about. And then I also like to um, look at and highlight individuals who we may not be as familiar with, like Earl Anthony, who was in the uh, Black Panther Party, um, and so I like to do that. I also do more contemporary work. I'm very interested in the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Student Movement in particular, uh, with a focus here on Los Angeles, but I look at it uh, broadly up and down the state of California and then also throughout, um, throughout the country. So and I'll look at it historically as well as presently. So I'm working on a uh, current um, study looking at the role of the Black Liberation Collective in their role in student activism, um, really kind of kicking off after the murder of um, uh, in um, Ferguson, um, um, Michael uh, Brown. I also do a lot of work on um, critical thinking in Africana studies, or you know, African deep thought, which kind of leads me to, as uh, Rhett mentioned earlier, uh, my my handbook. And even though it says pursuing academic excellence in Africana studies. A lot of my focus, a lot of the things that I that I introduce here is relevant not only in Africana studies, but in other departments and programs and other majors and what have you as well, with a real focus on helping students transition from high school into college. Um, and I'd like to not have this be a, a, a one off, right? So I share my contact information here for those of you who may you know, want to stay in contact with me. You have my email address and you can follow me on Instagram as well as on uh, LinkedIn. And let me just jump into it because we talk a lot about Dr. King and you heard uh, Mrs. King talk about the, the world needing his message. 
he is not the originator of this idea of nonviolent direct action, but he is definitely in the United States the foremost spokesperson of the 20th century, championing this nonviolent direct action um, approach and his commitment to nonviolence, not only as a philosophy, but also as a way of life. And I'm going to discuss this a bit more as we move forward. But who was he? Who was he? It's important for us to know and understand that he, Dr. King comes from a long line of preachers. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, King's parents nurtured him to the point to where he said that he grew up in a loving family an environment where the children's needs were always met and was taught to make sure that he carried himself with dignity and respect. Carried himself with dignity and respect. He's born in 1929. So he is a child through the depression. He, in his formative years, is living through World War II. So he sees poverty in his youth. He sees war in his youth. He also sees the ugly head of Jim Crow, which I'll come back to in a moment. But right now, young Martin and, and, and his family King says that he was instilled with a moral compass, and this would later guide his work. He says of um, he he says that, and that, this is a quote. He says it is quite easy for me to think of a God of love, mainly because I grew up in a family where love was central, and where lovely relationships were present. End quote. <clears throat> so at his very foundation, he's, he's seeing and saying that love is central to his very core. This is not something that he learned in school. It was modeled for him at home. He describes his mother, Alberta Williams King, as soft-spoken and easygoing, yet never complacently adjusted herself to the system of segregation. Nice, kind woman. But that does not mean that she has to accept Jim Crow, does not have to accept racism, does not have to be uh, accept being treated any less than any human should be treated. He recalls that his mother taught him to feel a sense of somebodyness, despite the realities of racism and the system of Jim Crow that would threaten his humanity and dignity. She told him that she opposed the system and that I must never allow it to make me feel inferior. This is the lesson that he's getting from his mother early in life. King says of his father, Martin Luther King Sr., he describes him as a very physical presence, a strong and self-confident man. This is important. I want to highlight this because oftentimes we overgeneralize the experiences of Black folks in the American South always being beat down, downtrodden, feeling less than. King is saying, that is not my house. And as a matter of fact, when you begin to do uh, more of the study and read the autobiography and look at there were a lot of people who are, that was not their experience. What their experience was loving homes, two parent homes. They were taught to see to carry themselves with dignity and respect, and they said that it's the issue is not you. The issue is the white people who are putting these things in place. So we are not the problem. We got to figure out how to help them with their problem. But I digress. I'll come back to that. Martin Luther King Sr. 
is the son of a sharecropper. He's described as a man of real integrity, deeply rooted to moral and ethical principles. Committed to moral and ethical principles. So King Senior modeled strength and confidence for his children. He had a model of strength and confidence in his father. Give you an example. Give you an example. In his autobiography, well, King actually didn't write an autobiography, but he did a lot of speaking and a lot of writing. And so Claiborne Carson would later compile a lot of that and use King's own words to uh, create an autobiography, essentially. But he did not formally write an autobiography, but Carson formal, you know, took some pieces and put it together. But in it, King says he recalls a trip to a shoe store with his father where they sat in empty seats in the front of the store. The white clerk politely asked them to move to the seats in the back where he would assist them. After a brief exchange, King Sr. took his son and left without purchasing shoes, refusing to accept Jim Crow. King also remembers the time when his father was pulled over driving, pulled over by a white policeman who addressed his father as a boy, to which King Sr. retorted, and I quote, let me make it clear to you that you are not talking to a boy. If you persist in referring to me as a boy, I will be forced to act as if I don't hear a word you are saying, end quote. So King Senior then is demonstrating that you have to have a moral compass. Make sure that even though you can be treated a particular way, you do not have to accept it. And you ensure that you do not lower yourself. You continue to demand dignity and respect. And his father modeled this from him, modeled this for him. Boom. Also, and, and very important, very important in understanding Dr. King. Again, he's about five years old. Um, and he had a friend, a white childhood friend. His father owned a store across the street from where he grew up. And the kids would play together all the time. But when he came of age and they were ready to go to school, the little white boy's father told him, you can no longer play with little Martin. Hurt and confused, little Martin discussed the situation with his parents. They shared with him the realities of racism and Jim Crow and racial injustice. Dr. King recalled, and I quote, I'm going to use a lot of quotes here because I want you to hear, I want you to have Dr. King's voice, his words. King recalled, I was greatly shocked. And from that moment on, I was determined to hate every white person. As I grew older, this feeling continued to grow. Now, I know for many of us, we have not heard any reference to Dr. King hating white people. But that seed was planted in him at a young age. He said his parents reminded him of his Christian duty to love all, but, burn, but the burning question remained, and I quote, how could I love a race of people who hated me and who had been responsible for breaking me up with one of my best childhood friends, end quote. King's reflecting on his Christian values and his family upbringing, but it, there was contradiction in the real world that he had to live in. So as he gets older, he's going to continue to experience different things that's going to have this hate for white people 
continue to grow, like having to stand for hours on a bus when he was coming back from a um, from a speech competition. There were seats on the bus, but they were in the front where the white people were supposed to, and so he and his teacher had to stand up. That's just one example. Years later, I'm fast forwarding through this kind of quickly because I want to get to kind of the, the meat of what I want to share today. But, but I want us to have some sense of Dr. King, the man. We oftentimes know Dr. King, the icon, but Dr. King, the man. Years later, as a student at Morehouse, King's intellect and commitment to racial and social justice continued to advance. He participated in oratorical competitions. He presided uh, as president of the sociology club. He majored in sociology in college. He became a, a member of the debate team. So he was in, on the debate team. He was in student council. He was in a glee club. He was in a minister's union. He was in the Morehouse chapter of the NAACP. And he played on the Butler Street YMCA basketball team. I know we don't think about Dr. King playing ball, but apparently he could hoop. Not only that, apparently Dr. King was real good at playing pool also. Like if he didn't have this moral compass, he could have been a pool shark. Like they said that he was like, he could get down on the pool table. And for some of you who have seen some pictures of what have you being shared, you might've seen this classic picture of Dr. King shooting pool, like different places where he would go. He was sometimes in different cities um, when he's talking to you know people in the neighborhood. He poke his head into a into a pool hall and go there and play pool with people from time to time. Like apparently he could get down on the pool table. All right. <clears throat> but he's involved in a lot of things. During the summer after his sophomore year, King wrote a letter to the editor of the Atlanta Constitution in response to a race to racial injustice and murder in Georgia, concluding that black people wanted their basic rights respected and shared in equal opportunity as American citizens. Don't forget, Dr. King started college at 15 years old. So as a sophomore, 16 years old or so, he's writing a letter to the editor talking about racial injustice and demanding uh, um, uh, 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 redress, demanding freedom, demanding basic rights. He would later publish The Purpose of Education in the Maroon Tiger, which was the, which is the paper for uh, Morehouse, where he says, and I quote, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only the power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate, end quote. In other words, it's not just about the letter grades, it's not just about the subject matter, it's about what are you going to do morally and ethically with the information you receive. That's true education. He reveals a growing commitment to social justice in his early publications, and even more so as he uh, continues on <clears throat> in his uh, theological seminary studies. He learns about pacifism. He learns about nonviolent direct action. He learns about the social gospel. And one of his papers, in a seminary, King writes, and I quote, above all, I see the preaching ministry as a dual process. On the one hand, I must attempt to change the soul of individuals so that their societies may be changed. On the other, I must attempt to change the society so that the individual soul will have a change. Therefore, I must be concerned about unemployment, slums, and economic insecurity. I am a profound advocator of the social gospel, end quote. He's a teenager writing this. He's a teenager writing this. This commitment to social justice and using the ministry as a vehicle is already percolating inside of him. It's already there at his foundation, at his base, at his core, 
building upon the foundation that his parents had laid for him and that his family and his community had laid for him. He was articulating a need for individual and social shifts while also developing a profound talent for clearly articulating his thoughts and ideas to the masses. He didn't just show up out of nowhere at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. He had been thinking about this. He had been training for this. He had been preparing for this. Later, while earning his doctorate at Boston University, King helped organize and participated in the Dialectical Society, where a dozen Black the uh, theological students met monthly, discussed philosophical and theological ideas, and how to use them to liberate Black people from the shackles of racial injustice in the United States. In doing so, King was grounding himself intellectually through rigorous study and dialogue about critical issues, as well as theories and approaches to address them. And it was in these environments, both at Morehouse and seminary, as well as in his doctorate, where he began to interact more with white people, that he began to, um, <clears throat> where his hate of white people began to diminish and go down. It's not about white people, but it is about justice. It's about justice. So as we continue to look at and develop and understand Dr. King, understand that nonviolent direct action is not simply just showing up and not doing anything violently. No, there are steps. There are steps. There is a process. And there were trainings to learn how to engage in nonviolent direct action. Four basic steps to nonviolent direct action. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. You don't just show up and do something. You do your research first. Like we, we know that there's some injustices, but we got to do our homework. Come in with some specifics. Come in with evidence. And then once we have done our homework, once we come in with evidence, then we come to the table with the stakeholders, city officials, businesses and corporations, whoever it may be. You come to the table and you negotiate. You share with them your, the, the evidence, the information that you've gathered and you try to have some common understanding to move forward. You don't just jump straight to protest. This was understood. There are steps to this. Okay, if the negotiation is successful, then you stop there and everything is fine. If the negotiations are unsuccessful, then you move to the next step, which is self-purification. And King would always say, that this is one of the most important steps that people would oftentimes skip over. Can't skip over it. Self purification. What this means then is we have to prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually, as well as physically, to engage in nonviolent direct action. It's not just preparing the body to absorb whatever physical abuse may come your way. But you have to prepare mind, spirit, and emotions. Have to prepare. That's the self-purification. You have to purify before going into action. You have to continue to purify during the action. And you have to purify coming after the action. But once one is going through that self-purification action, this is before the action starts, then you go into the direct action, whether that be the sit-in, whether that be the march, whether that be picketing, whatever the case may be. You'll just jump to the action. Four basic steps to nonviolent direct action. And the King Center 
run by Dr. King's daughter. To this day, is still developing, still teaching, still sharing these four basic steps to nonviolent direct action. It's important for us to look at and understand Dr. King as a mobilizer. He was an organizer. Oftentimes we limit our understanding of him to his speeches. And he had some great speeches and some great sermons and he wrote very well. I probably read and or listened to over 60 of his speeches, sermons and writings by this point. And he was very good at all of them. But I want us and need us to understand that Dr. King was a mobilizer. What that means is he had the ability to educate the masses about a particular issue. He had the ability to inspire people to do something about injustice. And he had the ability to move people into action. He was a mobilizer. He was an organizer. We have to understand him, yes, as a great orator, but an orator towards a purpose. And that purpose was freedom. That purpose was freedom in the broadest sense of the word. I'll come back to that in a bit. We're familiar with some of these with, with some of these pictures from the Montgomery bus boycott as a great example of his ability. Yes, it was not Dr. King alone who organized the Montgomery bus boycott, but he was as the president of the Montgomery uh, um, uh, uh, protest you know, committee, right? Who's putting that on? Right? Like, he became the voice and the champion, right, of this um, of this boycott. But look at how empty, when over 60% of the bus riders in Montgomery were black, for over a year, people, black people did not ride these buses. That takes mobilizing. That takes organizing. That takes inspiration. After the Montgomery bus boycott, King would, um, and others would found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as an umbrella organization with a basic objective um, to attain civil rights through protest activity, to put together nonviolent direct action training, to develop leadership training. Just because you are in a position of leadership does not make you a leader. King understood that. People have to be trained and taught and developed to be reared into leadership. Our titles don't make us leaders. Our ability to mobilize, organize, inspire, and collaborate and work with other people, that's leadership. Forget the title. Lots of folks with titles are not leaders. Lots of folks without, without the title are very much so leaders, but I digress. They also develop citizenship schools. I have a, um, uh, some, uh, if you haven't heard of the, of the, um, Lady's name, her name is uh, Dorothy Cotton. Like the cotton, like you use, like you know, you got to cut cotton, right? Dorothy Cotton. She was actually very um, central in the educational aspect of the Southern Leader Southern Christian Leadership Conference, right? Um, many of us don't know that Dr. King was stabbed. He was stabbed in the chest. The blade was so close to the heart that they said that if he had sneezed, it would have punctured his lung and he would have died. Dr. King was stabbed. He survived and still preached nonviolence. He was arrested dozens of times, still preached nonviolence. He's most known by many of us for his I have a dream speech. But I encourage us to read the whole speech. Listen to the whole speech, not just the part at the end where he says, I have a dream. 
that one day my foes will sit. Like, that's a great part. But read the earlier part where he's actually, or listen to the earlier part, where he's actually talking about the injustices, economic and social and otherwise. Not just the sound bites. We got lots of sound bites. The whole speech. And if you don't know, this lady here, you can see her here um, to King's left. That is Dorothy Height. Dorothy Height. I don't have time to get into it, uh, but Dorothy Height was um, president of the National Council for Negro Women for uh, nearly 40 years. And they were central, central in the civil rights movement and beyond. But I digress. But I encourage you, look up Dorothy Height. Um, she she's a phenom has a phenomenal um, story. Dr. King won the um, Nobel Peace Prize. Met Malcolm X. It's important for us to highlight this because oftentimes people put Malcolm and Dr. King in at, uh, uh, at odds with each other, against each other, but they also had mutual respect for each other and admiration for each other. There's a new book that came out just last year, I think it is, um, where new evidence has been revealed to where King was misquoted, was misquoted in an article that came out about his views about Malcolm X. He did not have any issues with Malcolm X, the person. They may have differed in philosophy, in, in, philo in philosophy and ideas, but he had great respect and admiration for Malcolm. Malcolm X had great respect and admiration for Dr. King. So much so, real quick, a tangent, but so much so that after the Birmingham bombing that killed the four little girls, Malcolm X sent a message to the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in the area. And basically, I'm paraphrasing, but basically said that if anything happens, to Dr. King and anybody in his group while they down there in Birmingham doing what they're doing, anything happens to him or any of them, you're going to have to deal with me and my people from up here in the north. Sent the message to the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and nothing happened to Dr. King or anybody in his group while they were in Birmingham investigating, um, investigating that. Many of us don't know that Dr. King lived for a year. In the on the south side of Chicago, in 1955, 66, which is the slums of Chicago, <clears throat> they began to understand that the civil rights movement was a middle class black folk uh, movement. That the masses of folks in the north, in the Midwest, and in the west had the right to vote, had integrated lunch counters and buses, and so on and so forth. So for King and his and, and his cohorts, he said, let's go and stay here. Get an idea of what's going on here, the conditions that the people are experiencing. Dr. King said that the most violent, hateful, and abusive experiences he ever had was not in the South, was not in Mississippi, was not in Alabama, but was in Chicago in the north. So I'm saying that to say, don't separate the south, south bad, north good. Racism was everywhere, still is. It may look different in certain places, but that doesn't mean that it didn't exist. And so here, this is a picture of Dr. King being um, attacked in Chicago. Many of us don't know that Dr. King wrote many books. He wrote many books. Wrote several articles. Much of what I'm going to share with you as I move forward is going to come from his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. Don't forget that Dr. King was a family man. Don't forget Dr. King was a family man. Think about his, think about what his martyrdom did to his family. What his martyrdom did to his young children. 
Think about his sacrifice traveling around the country and around the world. They had a father, but he wasn't there because he was championing the cause for freedom and justice, which took him out of his home, which took him away from his children. Even if they understood to some degree what daddy was doing was important and good, their father was still not at home. He's a family man. These are pictures of Dr. King less than a year before he was killed. He's on vacation, part vacation, part work. He's in the Caribbean in Jamaica, spending some quality time with Mrs. King, but he is also working, writing on his last book that he wrote, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Okay. Um, and so we see some pictures of, of King here uh, resting, but he's also working. <clears throat> All right. We are familiar with King and his speeches. I want us to become increasingly uh, understanding and familiar with King and his actions. What was he doing? As a, a, as a leader of the SDLC, we should know and understand that he was instrumental in bringing about Operation Breadbasket. Operation Breadbasket essentially sought to bring new jobs into the Black community by saying to white establishments, I mean, by saying to Black people about the white establishment, don't buy where you can't work. So if they won't hire you here, don't buy there and spend your money at the Black-owned stores, the Black-owned insurance companies, the Black-owned banks, the Black-owned grocery stores, if the white folks don't want to hire you. And so this was successful in places like Cleveland, which brought about thousands of new jobs for Black folks in Cleveland, which means it benefited not only their families, but also their communities. I've talked briefly about the Chicago campaign. The Chicago campaign really targeted slum living conditions. They went on rent strikes to, boy, to, to, to protest the living conditions. In the final months of his life, he was organizing the Poor People's Campaign to have another march on Washington in search for better income, housing, and employment, organizing poor people around the country. And there's just some, some, uh, some visuals from the Poor People's Campaign, right? It's important for us to be um, familiar with this. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you, look into the Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King also had a special a special message for black people. Let me take take a listen. Dr. King in his words. Be proud of our heritage to somebody said earlier tonight. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. Somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionary and see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. Look at the word white. It's always something pure. Ah, hey. <laughs> But I want to get the language right tonight. I want to get the language so right that everybody here will cry out, yes, I'm black, I'm proud of it, I'm black and beautiful. So I wanted to share this because we oftentimes in our discussion of Dr. King, we hear him talking about 
all of humanity as if he didn't have a special message for black people. Yes, he was talking about all of humanity, but as a black man, he had a he he, he did have a message for black people. And we should be aware of that message. We should hear that message. We should celebrate that message. Ah. <clears throat> Dr. King was advocating for black people to amass power. Power as he understood it was the ability to achieve a purpose. But you develop that power with love. He says there's three types of loves and don't get them confused. He says there's eros, he's talking, this is Latin, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love. That's not the love that he's talking about when he says love those who are abusing you. That's not the love he's talking about. Philia, that's the affection between friends. That's not the love that Dr. King is talking about here. He's talking about agape. Agape is understanding, redeeming, goodwill for all. So when he says love those who are committing wrongs against you, he says understand them and know that human beings have, the, have a redeeming quality in them. You can love them as human beings and not like what they do. That's what Dr. King was saying. He says, and I quote, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. We want to clarify what Dr. King meant about love because that becomes the foundation for this moral plan. His moral compass was rooted in love, but this is the love he's talking about. And on this point, we should be clear. Dr. King says that we have to have a social power. We talk about power, now specifically, we have to have a social power. That is, and I quote, the Negro must seek to transform his condition of powerlessness into a creative and positive power, end quote. This is not synonymous with white power slogans. This is different. This is power in love, power in positive power, power in creativity to transform one condition for betterment of not just for black folks, but for all folks. Dr. King said that nonviolent direct action will continue to be a significant source of power until it is made irrelevant by the presence of justice. The reason why we continue to talk about nonviolent direct action, the reason why we continue to talk about resistance and protest is because justice is not present for all people around the world all day, every day. So nonviolent direct action continues to be relevant and appropriate. Dr. King says we have to have an economic power. This is that moral plan. You have, to have, a, you have to have power with love. You have to have a social power, an economic power, where King advocates for our young people. Our young people need to think of union careers as earnestly as they do of business careers and professions, end quote. Unions have a built-in power structure to protect the vulnerable, to protect the masses, <clears throat> to advocate on their behalf, and to build power collectively. King calls on Black consumers to, quote, support those businesses that will give a fair share of jobs to Negroes and to withdraw its support from those businesses that have discriminatory practices, end quote. I talked about this with regards to uh, Operation Breadbasket. your protest with your dollar. You don't respect my humanity, you don't get my dollar. Dr. King says we need a political power, which he refers to as the development of a strong voice that is heard in the smoke-filled rooms where party debating and bargaining proceed. 
Yes, we need to have somebody in that room, he said. But they have to have a moral compass. Along with his political power, but he says education without social action is a one-sided value because it has no true power potential. Social action without education is a weak expression of pure energy. The protest has to be informed. The social action has to be informed. There's political power in social protest. So we should be hesitant to critique those who have engaged in social action because social action is a form of political power. And he says, and I quote, our policies should have the strength of deep analysis beneath them to be able to change the clever sophistries of our, of our opponents, end quote. King is challenging us to have a moral compass to be able to rewrite, challenge unjust laws and to know in your soul, at your very core, that you are on the side of right, on the side of justice, that's political power. And so King advocates on a global scale, a revolution of values. We've lost our way, King would say. Our values and our respect for humanity and the common good. King says, and I quote, a genuine revolution of values means the final, mean in a final analysis that our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies, end quote. I know he used the language of mankind and that was very common at that time period, but here he's talking about humanity, the valuing of all of humanity. If we're valuing the all of humanity, then we can ill afford to oppress people financially, to ill afford to oppress people physically, socially. They're, they would have at least basic uh, uh, conditions for all people, right? Basic conditions fit for humans, not fit for a dog or a cow, but fit for human beings. King said all inhabitants of the globe are now neighbors. This worldwide neighborhood has, has been brought into a being largely as a result of modern scientific and technological revolutions. He's saying this in 1967 and 68. Imagine what he's saying now, how much closer we've gotten as a result of the technology, how fast we can fly from here to, from here to there or uh, message someone instantaneously. Some of us are old enough to remember making long distance phone calls or sending a letter and that take a long time. Now I can message somebody across the world and they get it in a matter of seconds. We're closer than ever, but do our values match the closeness of humanity? I'm a, I'm a, I know I'm running up on, on short on time. So let me end with this. Let me end with this. <clears throat> Why we celebrate Dr. King? We celebrate Dr. King because of his undying commitment to struggle for freedom. So much so that he was willing to give his life for it. He knew that he was going to die and did not stop the struggle. What do you and I have that we are so committed to and passionate about that we are uh, 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 committed to that we would give our life for it. We celebrate him because he was willing to give his life for the struggle of freedom. We celebrate Dr. King because of his ability to instill hope. To instill hope. You can take a look at the whole of the African American experience and say, how do these people keep going forward? As the Reverend Jesse Jackson said, keep hope alive. 
Dr. King had the ability to continue to empower, inspire. We celebrate him for that. But not just a ideal dream or some uh, um, pie in the sky hope. But we celebrate him for his proven track record for inspiring action. Not just words, but action to create change. And he was successful at it to varying degrees. We can have that conversation. But he was successful at it to varying degrees. We celebrate Dr. King for his undying love and faith in humanity. Even moments where he got depressed, and he did. He admitted that he had times where he was depressed. He had times where he began to lose faith. But his undying love and faith in humanity kept him going when many others would have thrown in the towel. This is why we celebrate Dr. King. So when we celebrate him on his birthday, it's not about just, oh, this is the day that he was born and he had some dream. Yes, it's that and so much more. But as Mrs. King said, we also celebrate Dr. King because you and I today need his message of love and the, and the struggle for justice. Thank you. I'll end it there. And please, let's stay in contact with each other. Thank you so much, Dr. Claybrook, for providing such a historical framework on who Dr. King was as a man and then all of the leadership that he provided to this country. In the few minutes that we have remaining, I'm going to stop the recording and I want to see if anybody has a question for you while we have you on the line. 